Wow. This has been such a wonderful uh, journey. I was in part of it with them as they began the Venture Marriage uh, Ministry. And um, they have poured their hearts into it. And every one of them came out of a busted situation where their own marriage was not, you know, not everybody knew, but it wasn't good. And it's beautiful because that's what happens when you, when God works in your life, it immediately overflows. And thank you so much for the efforts that you put into it, Paul, for the pastoral oversight you've given. And this is so exciting to see this uh, being birthed. And I'm excited to be with you today. And I'm just going to jump right in. But before I do, I know some of you are here today because you've got a, you've just kind of begun your relationship and you're getting into that power struggle phase a little bit. Some of the drugs are wearing off after you got married <clears throat> and you're waking up with a, with a, with a, you know, a romantic hangover and it's, uh, <clears throat> and it doesn't feel good. And some of you are, um, you know, just beginning to just hit that phase. Others of you are, uh, have been uh, what, in what I call a parallel marriage where you're not fighting and you're not, uh, you know, about to break up. But there's, uh, uh, instead of really making connection your priority, you're, you're focusing on managing the distance. Like, I want to be close, but not too close. Why? Because we all have this certain fear of intimacy uh, that keeps us from becoming... Uh, close. So we end up in parallel tracks. Not good. God wants more than that for us. Some of you here, as I pray for you, I believe some of you here because you feel like this is the last stop before a divorce court or before a miracle. And we're going to ask God today for the miracle. If you're here today and that's you, God has a miracle for you today to, to, to begin to shift and change things. We're trusting him for that together. So with that, um, Peter gives some great uh, advice for marriage in 1 Peter chapter 3. But I want to say that as I have been with couples for years, the thing, three things I think every couple desires. Everyone wants a relationship that is safe. Safety is primary. If a relationship is not safe, nothing can happen. Secondly, they want it safe so there can be connection. So we experience connection. And when we experience connection, we get what we want is passion and full aliveness. Because when you feel connected, everything works. But in order for there to be connection, there has to be safety. And those two are very, a very delicate dance in a balance. When it's safe, you can connect. When you feel connected, you tend to keep it safe. But the moment there's a drop of negativity in the space between you, there's a feeling of disconnection. And that's where our problems begin. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Peter says... Um, he says in verse 7 to husbands, he says, Husbands, live in an understanding way with your wives. That's a beautiful word, understanding. It's a word that means consider all the aspects of who she is in terms of her emotional makeup, in terms of what turns her off, what turns her on, what lights her up, what really discourages her. Consider all that before you say something <laughs> or do something is to have all of that in mind. And so, uh, you know, it's, Peter gives a lot of instructions to women. The first six verses are to women. And he only gives one to us men because he realizes, you know, we can't absorb it a lot. But if we can get this one thing, we've got it. And that's to consider all aspects before you, uh, before you say something that brings her pain. And if you'll do that, if you'll do that to, and keep the relationship safe, your wife will open her heart to you and she will become everything you ever dreamed of. Okay? Then he uh, talks to, to wives in the first six verses and essentially what he says, he says if you will, uh, first of all, your husband's not going to be won by words. <laughs> and the more you talk, the less that, you know, he's going to be won over. So, um, 
he, but, he, but what he is saying is that husbands are melted when you respond to them in, an, in a, a demeanor of respect, a respectful demeanor. And when you do that, it makes it safe for your husband to open his heart. And when he opens his heart, he'll become everything you ever dreamed of in a partner. That's God's design for marriage. God's design is a marriage that glorifies him. And a marriage that glorifies him is one that's, that's consistently connected. Has a stable, secure, and sustainable connection with each other. Not a parallel marriage. Not a silent divorce. But one that's connected. So that's what we're going to hit on briefly today. And then we're going to come back in the new year and do, do some more. So... The core question uh, that I've asked for years is, why do couples fight? And I've discovered couples fight for one reason. It's because they object to difference. It's an objection to difference. It's unconscious, but whenever your partner objects to something, you have a reaction that you don't realize you're reacting. And that's why, it, you know, reactions to difference. As soon as there's a difference and there's that reaction, then your body stops, your brain stops triggering those wonderful neurochemicals of dopamine, norepinephrine, and the right balance of serotonin and all. That's what you get when you feel connected. But the moment there's a, a, a disconnection, your, your, your brain stops triggering that, and your adrenal gland triggers cortisol. And cortisol is anxiety. And so, uh, so the feelings of full aliveness are replaced with anxiety at the moment there's a feeling of disconnection. And disconnection begins to occur when you object to difference. What do you mean by that? Well, here's an example. Conflict is the result. Here's an example. She says, make sure that when you load the dishwasher, you face the dishes inward and you put all the silverware sorted in the tray so we don't, and, you know, and so and don't turn it on so we don't, until it's full, so we don't waste energy. And she's passionate about that. And you say, you know what, it really doesn't matter which way they're facing, they'll get clean either way, and just put the silverware in there and we can sort it out when we put it away. And it really doesn't cost that much more energy. All right? Can you relate to that? It's difference, but there's an objection to difference. Who's right? Who's wrong? But anyway, she feels... She's left feeling, you never listen to me. And he's left feeling what? Can you guess? You're always telling me what to do. All right? Objection to difference. And that's the source of all conflict. And what happens when, you know, when you have conflict, it leads to polarization. And if polarization continues, that's what leads to violence. In the marriage... But also in our world, as you can see. All, everything I'm saying about marriage is true in our world as well. It's true in your relationships at work. It's true in relationships with your children. It's true in relationships with your extended family. So when that which is different is seen unconsciously as a threat to our personhood. That's why we're so reactive to that. So I want to talk about connection. It's the fundamental the fundamental issue, because when we feel connected, we, we, feel that, we feel that full aliveness because we are, uh, God's created us as, to be connected. We all know that when we feel connected with him, that's when we're at our best. When we feel disconnected from him, that's when we, you know, descend to our worst. And so uh, the importance of connection is that couples fight when they have that objection to difference. They begin to feel like they're not connected and they don't like it. And I just want to say to you, just to, to make it your goal, connection. Don't make it your goal just to manage distance and get along. Say, you know, look at each other. We're going to ask you to do that in a moment. Look at each other and say, I want to make a commitment to where we really make connection our priority. Because when you feel connected as a couple, everything works. When you, you know, I said all the neurochemicals are there for you. And it just works. Conflict resolution, you can, resol you can resolve conflict and not connect. Problem solving is important. You can solve problems and not connect. But if you connect, if that's your priority, conflict res resolution is relatively easy. Problem solving is relatively easy. Why? Because the enemy is not each other. It's you're together approaching the problems, the challenges of life. But when you feel disconnected, guess what? The opposite is true. Nothing works. 
I mean, you know, cortisol replaces the pleasure chemicals. Anxiety replaces that full aliveness. And then that's when you feel that anxiety, that's when things are triggered from your lower brain. I'm talking about your, your brain stem and your limbic system and your unconscious. Things, uh, memories are triggered and you don't realize it because it's unconscious. The unconscious childhood defenses occur. Those are activated and that makes it worse. And uh, polarization and further disconnection a result. And the problem is our efforts, this is what I find with couples, the more you try to make it better, the worse it gets. Why is that? Why is that? Well, I'm going to show you a video to show how we, we thrive on connection from the very beginning. And then we experience disconnection. And all of our life is just a journey to try to find connection again. And I believe in, in deep, and down, deep down inside, that's a drive to be really connected with God, but also with our partner. So this is a video, uh, just a two-minute video from uh, a Dr. Uh, Edward Tronick from Harvard University. And he shows in the very beginning stages of how, how we respond. Remember what I said, when you feel connected, what happens? Everything works. You're fully alive. When you feel disconnected, what happens? Nothing works, and you feel anxiety. Watch this. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still face experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby, the baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. Okay. Okay. I'm here. And what are you doing? Oh yes, oh what a big girl. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation, and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Pretty graphic, no? And what we do is we replay that pattern over and over in our lives, feeling disconnected, anxious, reactive, look, getting the connection, feeling okay, 
See, and that's what happens in our marriage. I just want to take a moment for a discussion. If we had more time, I'd just have you turn your tables to do this. But we have some material I want to make sure we get to. Plus, you have some, an assignment I'm going to give you to work on, a little uh, exercise to do. But let's just uh, discuss it just openly. Someone share. It, it, what I say is connection is our deepest desire. Losing that connection is our deepest fear. So, so how do you see this human need for connection being a factor in your own relationship? Someone just want to just blurt it out, share it. Right. Feeling heard. So not just being told an answer, you need to do this or do that, but feeling heard. And that's how connection happens. Yes. Good. Yes. They're, these two are very closely related. Because what ha- and if you lose your spiritual connection, then you're not really accountable <laughs> to your partner, right? But if you want to be connected with your partner, where does God send you? I mean, if you really want to be connected with God, where does God, where does God send you? He sends you to your partner, right? He says, go and make things right first. And so they're connected together. Yes. Yes. Um, I think like, things have been like, really crazy at work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so so you're saying that right. Outside stresses like work, especially during these times, you're going tends to rob you from the time, you know, a 15 minute quick lunch rather than what you used to do and you feel more connected. Yeah, those are those are factors. And you see uh, what about the still face itself? You know, I mean, your, your husband is so avid, such an avid fisherman. Every time he talks about it, you feel like fishing is the other woman. So, when he, so you, you do not share his enthusiasm about fishing. So when he talks about it and he's excited, what do you do? Still face. <laughs> and what does he feel? He feels that disconnect, right? So how, there's a way to resolve that, okay? I'm not going to leave you right there, but, but later we'll talk about that, okay? Uh, yes. We got another... Yes. I think it's a little bit like you took my side, but I still kind of my connection. Mm-hmm. If you want to sometimes give back something. If I don't feel I have my connection, it's hard for me to give back. Shuts the relationship down. Yeah, that's it. Well, so why do we feel disconnected? Why is this happening? It's a, it's a phenomenon in psychology, you call it emotional symbiosis. Uh, the anxiety and disconnection result from symbiosis, and along with symbiosis is what we call self absorption. <clears throat> when I speak of self absorption, I'm not speaking of a judgmental term, you're just being selfish. I'm speaking about the fact I'm in so much pain, I cannot see your reality. All I can see is my reality. That's what I mean by being self-absorbed. And so symbiosis is the unconscious assumption that other people share your subjective states, thoughts, and feelings. Nothing could be further from the truth. You have two realities, two ways of experiencing the same phenomena that are different. But what happens when there's a difference? There's a reaction and objection to difference, right? So, um, so here's the phrase we use for symbiosis. You and I are one, and I'm the one. <laughs> and that's what it is in romantic love, you know? Romantic love is not about the other person. It's all about what you're feeling. You are so amazing. You and I are one, and I'm the one. But then when you hit the power struggle... After all the drugs wear off and you're in the, you wake up, you know, in the power struggle, symbiosis is not pleasurable. Symbiosis is, uh, is not pleasurable because um, there's, you're, 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 you're saying that your reality is reality. Your experience should be his experience, her experience, and nothing could be further from the truth. So it's, um, it's all about me and any objection to that triggers conflict. Why can't we fix it? 
Well, here's the thing. If you try to fix a problem by talking about the problem, you will not fix the problem. Why? Because that's not the problem. <laughs> the problem is not the problem. The problem is what? Connection. The lack of it. Feeling disconnected. That's always the problem. You say, well, you're being simplistic, Chuck. No, it's simple, but it ain't easy. So if you find yourself arguing about the same things over and over again, you're probably not focused about what you really need to be talking about. Here's an example. Well, if you're arguing about the dishes or who's not helping with the kids or who's not picking up around the house, chances are you're just talking about symptoms and it gets worse. Because you haven't dealt with that space between you that's filled with negativity, criticism, blaming, defensiveness, someone over-talking, someone walking away. All of that makes the space between you unsafe. Connection cannot occur. So you have to look deeper because beneath those symptoms is the deeper issue usually around that lack of connection you feel. So here's a, a Katie and Frank. Now whenever I tell a story, I'll give you a link to my website where you can read tons of stories of couples. I always change the name so it's not really Katie and Frank. But <clears throat> Katie said, I can tell you, they came to me and said, I can tell you what the problem is. It's golf. The problem is golf. He works hard here in the valley and then on the weekends he's on the golf course with his friends. The problem is golf. And so I I, I was trying to kind of walk that back a little bit and start talking about connection and all that good stuff, but Katie was insistent. That's the problem. And fr you know, finally, one, it, Frank finally said, you know what? I'll quit golf. I'll stop. What? He, she said, he said, yeah, I'll, if that's the problem, I'll quit. And so the next weekend, Frank was not on the golf course with his friends. He was at home, but he was on the computer. He was in the garage. He was working in the yard. He was everywhere, but guess where? With Katie. <laughs> so the problem, <laughs> the problem was not golf. Now, now what happened in this situation was we had a little talk. We talked about that your ministry, Frank, is everywhere you go. You, you, it would be like pulling teeth to get him to go to a men's group. But he has a men's group out there on the golf course. So when he recognized, I said, you know, if you commit what you do to the Lord... What does it say in uh, Ephesians where it says, you know, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord, not as Colossians, uh, not, un, not unto men. So, okay, I'll just make my golf a form of worship. Is that possible? I said, absolutely. Commit it to him and do that. So within a few weeks, Frank was saying, you know what? I'm not addicted to it anymore. And I'm realizing it's a ministry. Do you know some of the people I'm playing golf with? You know who they are in the city in terms of influencers? And he, his eyes were open to the ministry he had. I'm going too much too further in this. The point is that when he got his life right, golf took its place. He didn't end up giving it up, but it found its place. And Katie was okay with it. Because it's no longer, it was no longer his exit from her. Why? She began to help make it safe for him to stay with her as he made it safe for her to connect with him. See how that works? That's, that's Frank and Katie. Okay, so in what ways do you find yourself in conflict over things that are just surface issues? I want you to think about that, and then we're going to go and finish our talk, and I'm going to put you into an exercise, okay? So how does it know, help to know that the root issue is the feeling of disconnection? Is it helpful? Is that helpful? Because that way, you see, when, when couples say, I'm going to give you a... And a wife will send me this, you know, an email this long about all the issues her husband has. I just say, don't, I'm not looking at that. That doesn't matter to me. Why? Because that's not the issue. The issue is you're feeling disconnected. And so when we, we get to that, then yes, we do have to work through those things. Yes, I do need more help around the house. Yes, I do this and that. But that's easy once we do put first thing first. God, Jesus said, you know, seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. You have your priorities right. Other things will come in their time. And with a lot more abundance than they would if you were just out seeking them yourself. Because they'll come when you, with the kingdom. As the kingdom is manifested in your life. In your family. In your ministry. In the same way there's an order there. 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on connecting with you and then everything else we want is possible. So one of the problems we have is that the challenges we had in the past growing up from the very beginning in our parent, with our parents, those challenges present needs in a relationship. They always show up as needs. So past challenges create current needs. And what we have to see is your past does affect your relationship in unconscious ways, ways you're not conscious. And you say, well, my ha I had a good past. My past doesn't reflect, it doesn't come out in my current relationship. Did I mention it was unconscious? <clears throat> it does. We have what we call a 90% rule of thumb here where basically 90% of what I'm upset about with my partner is rooted in the past. It's connected way back. My mom was fearful, single mom, very controlling. Who did I marry? The mirror image. She looks nothing like her. She's not, but controlling when she gets, you know. So what does that do? It triggers all of that old stuff in me, right? And, and it's like this. It's like, um, it's like if I were sitting here and, uh, you know, or standing here, and Graham said, you know, hey, you're talking too long. I want to. And he, he wants to talk to me, and he taps me on the shoulder. And I come around, and I hit him with the microphone. Well, Graham would wonder, what, what's that reaction about? Why is he so reactive to me? But then if he could look under my shirt, he could see a gaping wound and a shoulder that's black and blue, deep, with a deep bruise, very, very sensitive and painful. Then Graham would know, I'm not the source of Chuck's upset. I'm just the trigger. You see, if I don't know that, all I know is I'm hurting and you did it. <laughs> and then I come to my senses and I say, I shouldn't have been so reactive. You know, I can, but the damage is already done. Why? Because reactivity that's unconscious because of past wounds, unmet needs, challenges you had in childhood growing up. And also previous relationships. It goes all, there's a, there's a pattern that you'll find and, uh, and, okay, there's a pattern you'll see as you go through the dialogue process that I'm going to prescribe to you. We're not going to hit it all today, but, uh, but you'll start to see how it works even in the first exercise. So how do we make a relationship safe? I've already mentioned that a relationship is not just two people. A relationship is a husband and a wife and the space between you. That's a relationship. And that space between this couple is not empty space. Just like we know now in quantum physics, the space between uh, solar bodies or, you know, solar system planets in the solar system, that's not empty space. There are forces there that we now know exist. It's not empty. The space between you is not empty space. And so when that space between you is filled with safety, curiosity, wonder, Full aliveness is the result. Connection is possible. Full aliveness is the result. But when there's a knee-jerk reaction and that triggers what I just talked about, negativity in the space between, I start criticizing. Or, like you said, you know, I'm sharing my feelings and now she's trying to tell me she just shut me down and I didn't feel like I was hurt. I felt like the connection was broken because in her good intentioned desire to help you, she gave you advice. Now it's negative between us, and I'm reacting. You know, that's what my dad always did, <laughs> and now you're doing it, right? And, uh, and so, so it, let me just put it this way. This pristine, pure glass of water, if I were to put just one drop of sewage in it, who's going to drink it? I don't know what toxins are in there, so I'm not drinking it. That's the way a relationship, just a drop of negativity. Can I be a little, little negative? No, I'm going to prescribe to you next year when we come back together a, a, a policy, a commitment, a pledge of zero negativity. We'll talk about how to get there. But so, so we've got to move from this unconscious relationship where the, there's negativity to a conscious relationship where now when, when I get angry at my wife, I'll pause. And we have some tools now to help me pause before I react. And I always make the connection. I'm not angry at her. I'm angry at my mom again. <laughs> you know, and, she, and then I look and see, you know, she was trying to help me with that advice. 
it, there's no need for me to criticize her and, and hurt her because she's trying to help me. I need to start asking for what I need rather than telling my partner what she's not doing, right? So the couple's dialogue, and uh, you can uh, go to my website and you find a lot more about this. I'll give you a link to that in a moment. But there's three steps. There's mirroring, there's validating, and then there's empathy. And so we, uh, the goal is to always get to empathy. Because when I'm empathizing with you, did you know you, when you're empathizing with someone, you cannot hurt them? Empathizing. Because why? Because you see them as a human being. But what happens even in our most intimate relationships, we have this polarization that causes an objectification. And the moment I've objectified you and I don't see your reality and I'm not empathetic with you, then you're no longer a human being and I can treat you any way I want to treat you. I can criticize you. I can berate you. I can even walk out of the room when you're talking to me. Why? Because you're not a human being. So the goal is empathy to where when we empathize, then we dissolve that power struggle and we can reconnect. So those are three steps, mirroring. And those are the, these sentence stems that we use. When I say, let me see if I got you. When I say, let me see if I got you. What I'm doing, my wife one time came up to me. We were at a conference <clears throat> and she said, I don't think you realize how much it took for me to get here. And I'm so, and she was so mad at me. <clears throat> we're in the middle of this conference, right? And uh, she's so mad at me. And I said, and I, my, my lower brain reacted. There's my mom again. I'm done. I'm not doing this. I'm just walking out. I'm the turtle. I can just walk out and it's not going to hurt me. And then something caught me. I said, are you going to do that again? And so I said, let me see if I got you. You're saying you don't think that I realized all that you struggled with to get here and what it cost you and what you're feeling right now. Did I get it? Yes. Is there more about that? Yes. And she told me more. And I said, so you're saying this, that. Did I get it? Yeah. Is there more about that? It was not 40, 90 seconds. She was burst into tears. She said, I'm so sorry for my reaction. And we were hugging like this, you know. But, but that's not the way we would react. We would use, not use the tools. We would be, you know, a two-day standoff. We'd always come back together, but never better. Always maintaining that distance, right? So uh, we're going to talk about more about that, but let me just uh, put you into your, before we do uh, the, this, this dialogue process, we're going we're gonna to have you practice it. Before we do that, uh, and then we've got to hurry because we've got till 12.30, right? Okay, so, so let me just say the two things. Number one, the mirroring process will help you regulate your reaction. Okay, that's why I want to, you to learn that. To regulate your reaction and listen first. That's going to be powerful. Secondly, when you share an appreciation with each other, you change the energy. I, I've, I've worked with a lot of couples, and the worst of the worst of the worst that I've seen, and there's, this is no lie, this, and this is backed up because I've looked at this, and research has shown it too. The worst of couples, only 20% of the relationship is bad. At best, at worst. 80% is good. But why is it everything negative? Because all my brain pathways are negative. I see her as negative. <clears throat> when she walks in the room, I react. And all I see is negative. And if you develop those brain pathways, what's going to happen when you see your spouse? That's all you're going to see. That's the way they will always show up. Now we know from quantum physics, things show up the way we see them. So if I'll say, wait a minute, there's something I appreciate about you. What do I, I build a brand new brain pathway. If I do that again, I bring another one and another one and another one. Now I'm looking at the 80%. And when we got 80% going for us, 20%, it's easy to work on. At least we're encouraged to do that. <laughs> okay? So <clears throat> what happens quickly is that because feelings follow focus, energy follows attention, right? When you f what you focus on is what you'll get. If, you're, if you always focus on the negative, your partner will always show up negative. But if you focus, you know, like what he's done wrong, what she, you know, what she uh, always does and never does, or, 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 or how they di you disagree with me, you focus on that negative, that's the way you'll always see it. And if you focus on the positive, though, guess what? Your partner will show up that way. So the more you focus on the good, the more good there will be to focus on. And there's an example of a wife who was sharing with her friend, 
She, and her friend was giving her this advice. She said, just, just tell him something you appreciate about him. She said, there's nothing I appreciate about him. One thing. No. Come on, think about it. She thought for a moment. There's not one thing I appreciate about that man. And she kept going on, and that's how stuck you can get. And finally she said, well, he's good looking, but I don't like to look at him right now. <laughs> so, so she said, just say it to him. So she goes and she does it. And she says, wow, it was powerful. You know, it just, it landed on soft. It was a soft landing and for the first time. And then she says, I went on. And then she said, you know, I really appreciate how you are with our children. Because you bring things to our parenting plan and approach that I don't have. And she kept going. And then she told her friend in the end, she said, two things happened. Number one, the more I shared, shared that I appreciated, the more I saw that I appreciated. And secondly, the more I shared that I appreciated him, the more he appeared that way. The more he lived up to those things. So you want to bless someone, you want to change someone's life, share what you appreciate about them. Because they'll immediately see how they're not all that, but they want to be. And they'll start striving for it. And, and as a partner, a marriage partner, you have a powerful weapon. It's called appreciation. Okay, so, so let's, di let's do it. Let's demonstrate it. You have a, I'd like to have a couple come and uh, demonstrate it. Somebody that's kind of a, a little bit outgoing, is not afraid to get up here and fumble around a little bit. But I'm going gu to guide you through the thing, and then we're going we're gonna to do it ourselves. This will take five minutes. You want to do it? Come on up. At least I see one of you willing. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> do we, have, we always have one that's dragging and we have a draggy, right? Can I start? Well, yeah, well. I, I appreciate you always pushing me to do things. So get, up, get close. All right, so what I want you to do, and you're going to do this too, eyeball to eyeball, knee to knee. This is the way you do a dialogue, all right? Okay, can everybody see? All right. So... So I want you to look on your sheet, look on your sheet, and watch how I'm just going to follow the stems. You don't have to worry about it because I'm going to lead you, okay? All right. The first thing that's important in a, in a dialogue is to always ask for an appointment. Always ask for permission. Why? That respects a boundary. If I crash in on you and I say, hey, you know, you're, it's like you're watching a movie in your mind, and I say, pull down that movie and look at my movie. Well, you might do that once or twice, but you might resent it after a while. So if you say, especially when you get into sharing frustrations, you're going to say, is this a good time to share about what happened last night? Okay. And, you know, and so when you learn to do that in a safe way, your partner will be a receptive and you can have a dialogue. Okay? So always ask for an appointment. And then the second thing is I want you to look at each other in the eyes as best you can. Sometimes you can't do that if you're in a lot of pain. But I want you to make eye contact. The reason is your lower brain will pick up the pupils. And if those pupils are shrunken, your lower brain is going to say danger. Why? Because she's anxious. That's how, that's how subtle body language is. But if you see, if you take, if you look at each other and take a two deep breaths and your pupils dilate, you're going to look and you're going to feel safer just by that part right there. So what do we got? We got the appointment. Ask, is this a good time? Second take some deep breaths and then one person talks talks and the other person uses the mirroring skill with those three stems that I mentioned okay so that's what we're going to do so do you have something you wanted to appreciate you wanted to go first sure okay so here's what I want you to do and what's your name Liwan Li Liwan and Sandra Sandra so so Liwan I want you to say Sandra is this a good time to share an appreciation and appreciation think about this the way you look something you did I appreciate you make me coffee this morning or some aspect of your personality or character that I appreciate appreciate the way you are with our kids something like that so those are things to think about do you have something sure okay so is, I say is this a good time so is this a good time no <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I mean something that I want to say about it like it depends obviously now yes but if we are upset I feel like it's not a good time. So, yes, you can say no, but the rule is within 24 hours, you, you, you give him a time where he can talk and you're just going to listen. So, she met, Sandra made a great point. That's, that's why we do the appointment because, I mean, I may be just answering an email and my wife does, she thinks I'm doing nothing, but I'm actually working, right? And answering an email, but, or it may be that, no, I don't want to talk about that yet, but I will talk about it with you. Okay. Give me two minutes. 
So look at each other and uh, take a deep breath and say to Sandra, Sandra, one thing I appreciate about you is... One thing I appreciate, appreciate about you is that you push me out of my comfort zone sometimes. So let me see if I got you say that. Let me see if I get it. You said. So what you say is that you appreciate when I when I pull you out of your comfort zone. Now say, did I get it? Did I get it correctly? Yeah. And now say, is there more about that? It's more about it. Let the more be. When I see how you push me out of my comfort zone, I feel. So just say that. Okay. okay. When, what's that? When I see how you push me out of my comfort zone, when I see how you do that, I feel inside. Uh, when I see how you push me out of my comfort zone, I feel, uh, I, don't, I don't know, in the moment I'm nervous, but it's like afterwards I, I really appreciate, you know, the fact that you did, and it's like, because it usually ends up in something good. So what I hear you saying is... What I hear you say is when I push you out of your comfort zone, um, at the moment is... Sorry, I didn't hear you that one. <laughs> Uncomfortable, maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you realize that you can do it. <laughs> Sorry. No, can that you good things come me? out of it, usually. What do you say? That usually good things come out of that. Okay. Then good things come out of it. So you say, did I get it? Did I get it correctly? Yes. Don't, don't use the word correctly. Okay. That's a judgmental term. Right? Did I get it right? No, did I get it? Did I get you? Did I get you? Did I get you? Yes, you did. Okay. So is there more about that? Is, is there more about it? So let the more be. When I feel, when it feels so good that I finally get pushed out of the comfort zone, when I feel that, what that reminds me of when I was little is... Uh, I can't come up with an example that. Okay, just... Go, go with the emotion, you know. First I really resisted, I don't want to be pushed out, but then it's so good and I feel so much more. How do I feel? And what does that remind me? What does that whole experience remind me of when I was little? Uh, so I, I think what it, what it feels like being pushed out of my comfort zone is um, it, it gives me a sense of relief um, I don't know. Growing up, it was like, you know, you did things a certain way. So, yeah, growing up, you did things a certain way, and so if you did it different, that was weird or wrong. And so, it feels, it feels good stepping out. What, are you saying? what I hear you say is that when you come out of the comfort zone, uh, since your experience when you grow up was uh, different, that make you feel Great. <laughs> that make you feel like you can do it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Would you like to tell me more about it? Uh, maybe Is later, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, well, let's give them a hand, all right? Good job. All right. <clears throat> so, so, you, so you see how, uh, how mirroring is hard. Why? Because your brain's not used to doing that. You know, the moment you said one thing, I got 40 things in my mind I'm thinking and wanting to say, but I have to stop that. What I'm doing, I'm putting my reaction and opinions in the corner just to listen. And when I do that, I shift from the lower brain to the upper brain where I'm present. Mirroring says you matter. And what you have to say matters. I may not agree with it, but it matters and I want to hear it. Did I get it? Did I get all of it? And the reason we say that is so you're not going to get it all because you're not used to doing it, right? So I said this and I said this. So you're saying this. Did I get it? Yes. Is there more about that? See? And that turns on a switch called curiosity in your brain. Suddenly I'm curious in, rather than reactive to my partner. Okay? So what I want you to do, and, and we didn't do the summary for time. What we would have him do is summarize what, what uh, have Sandra summarize what was said, and then you, you're supposed to stand up and give her a one-minute full-body hug. 
So I want you to do that, okay? So you have, you guys have a, uh, let's do 15 minutes, take, take about seven or eight minutes each, and turn face to face, knee to knee, eyeball to eyeball, start with the appointment, the, decide who goes first, start with the uh, saying, is this a good time to share an appreciation? Then go for it. As soon as you're done, switch partners. I'll tell you when it's time to switch, okay? Go. Okay, all right, everyone. Let's take the last six minutes to just sort of sort of debrief. Whoop. Um, so gets a little bit of feedback. So what, what, what we wanted to see from the dialogue process is that something you did, cre uh, I responded with a feeling. And in this case, it's a positive one. It could also be, you know, later we'll talk about frustration. When, you know, I came home and the dishes were all over, left all over the sink and everything, I felt alone. I felt like I'm the only one that cares about stuff like that around here. So you can share a negative feeling in a positive way like that because your partner's mirroring that. So you felt alone. It's not judging. It's not criticizing. It's just how you feel. Using the I language, right? So when you say something... Uh, when you go to the feelings, you see how important that is? And, uh, and we had an example here where the first round, it was not uh, what I feel. It was, I feel you're a hard worker, and I feel you are this. And, I, and then I said, well, what about in here? Oh, when I see how hardworking you are, I feel secure. So she got in touch with a feeling, right? And then when, when uh, we, then we asked her, well, what that remind me of when I was little, what do you say? Uh, I, I just, uh, I didn't think about that, and so when I talked to him, I was like, maybe I feel secure because uh, I've seen my parents work hard, and so that they, they provided, so that I feel that he can, he's capable to do that. So the connection was, you, or you feel so familiar, why? Because what you're doing connects with feelings I had growing up. I felt so secure, and you're, help, you're, you're giving me that again, right? But it could also be the opposite. I appreciate you working so hard because I feel so secure. And what that reminds me of, my dad who was an alcoholic, I never felt secure, you see. So it could be the opposite. But getting in touch with what, what's driving the feeling is, is, is where you want to go, okay? That's why you do that. Okay. So, and we saw here, and we did a little more ex further exploration, and uh, I want is, can I share a little bit about that? Yeah. Just that, you know, he grew up in a very strict uh, household where being risky was not acceptable. You just didn't do that. He, who did he marry? <laughs> he married someone the opposite, right? That drags, drug him up here on the stage when he says, I would never do this. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, but that see that we marry someone that'll help us capture what we didn't get growing up. If you were suppressed sexually, who will you marry? You'll marry someone that's free sexually, and it'll terrify you. <laughs> you'll be terrified, and you'll try to kill it in your partner, right? Because because your partner has things in them that will help you grow, grow out, and grow parts of yourself that you never developed growing up. Okay, more about that later. Any other feedback? What was your experience? Three minutes left. I think when we went out, when we went there, I mean, like, yeah, I think when we went there, and Iwan say that I bring that part of him, part of me internally think, is that not good? Like, I don't know. So, but, like, I don't know. I feel maybe defensive. Defensive? Yeah. Okay. Recognize that you can be defensive about anything. I mean, something can trigger defense, even when your partner's sharing something positive. And that's why couples come back and say, it didn't work. Well, when you, when you look at what happened, well, you know, you were defensive before, you weren't really mirroring. Mirroring will help you regulate your defense and stay present. It'll literally shift your brain from lower crocodile brain to upper wise owl present brain literally okay all right so any other thoughts feedback okay let me encourage you to
take this home and practice it. And uh, just as uh, the uh, Courageous Conversations was so, such a breakthrough for, for, gray, you know, for th these two couples, uh, this was a really powerful thing in my life. So these kind of tools are really powerful, but they're not, you know, I, and I've got a whole article on how the best relationship tools in the world just don't work. Why? Because we don't work them. And that's the only reason. Because they'll always work if you work them. If you go through that courageous conversation, you'll get there. But it's just like, one person, I won't point them out, but they were in a previous class I did. This is a great refresher. And she said, did I practice it? No. And that's what we don't do. And, and believe me, I was a therapist long, and working with couples long before I was, you know, and I would resist practicing it in my own marriage until I realized, you know, it has to be come from here. I have to, it has to come from here and we have to, you have to be it to teach it and to lead it, right? So, um, so practice it. Let me encourage you to do that. Okay, and the final thing is there's uh, resources. If you want the PowerPoint slides, you can grab them with that QR code there. Just take them on your phone. That's a PDF of the PowerPoint slides. And if you want other resources, you can go to my website. That's the other one. Uh, and if you, don't, if you just get the PowerPoint slides, you can go later to chuckstarns.com. And scroll down on the home page to subscribe to my weekly blog post where I tell stories about these couples and how the, the, these tools work. Okay? And, uh, and there's also videos and archives of articles there as well. Okay? Graham? Thank you.